Hello, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen one moment. So let me go ahead and start this from the beginning. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Ayola, and I am one of the librarians at the Jersey City Free Public Library. I want to thank everybody for um, attending this event. This is Parenting on the Spectrum, and it is part of our programming for Autism Alliance Month. So um, the people who are on the Zoom call today are myself, once again, I'm the Emerging Technology librarian. And we have Morenike Giwa Onaiwu, who is, yes, an advocate, public speaker, writer, educator, researcher, and mom, which is what they're going to be talking about today. And the inspiration for this event came because I remember when we were programming all of these different events, I was reminded that a lot of the time when we're talking about autism acceptance um, and autism month more broadly, the landscape tends to be very filled with um, with parents who are not autistic or the term that I'm gonna be using is holistic, um, who are raising autistic children, you know, find, trying to find resources to best support their children. Um, this is what you will see in blogs. This is what you'll see in movies, on television, in books, et cetera, et cetera. And it often gets, it often gives the impression that there are not autistic people who themselves choose to be uh, parents. And even more rare is the idea that autistic people can be a parents to autistic children. So that is why I, I actually found um, Moraini Gay's website and I was really impressed with all of their work. Um, I became interested in the book that they collaborated on, which is called all the Weight of Our Dreams, which is about living with racialized autism. So I am very thankful that they were able to participate in this event today. So thank you once again. <laughs> sure, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yes, so my first question is, can you give us some basic information about your professional background and the path that led you to where you are today? Sure. And so to give the most honest answer, probably um, the path that led me here was anger. <laughs> yeah. um, I grew up and um, I've always been this person who, you know, I guess had this view of the world where I really wanted things to be a particular way. I wanted to believe that the things that they taught us when I was a child were true and they'd say, you know, everyone is, you know, worthy and you can be anything you want to be and, you know, blah, 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 all those sentiments, all those um, concepts um, that apparently people don't really believe. <laughs> I internalized those things and I thought that was, you know, the world that I was going to, to live in. And, um, you know, I learned, you know, progressively throughout my life at different stages that, okay, no, 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 you know, <laughs> these are just, you know, um, things that people like to say, but they don't actually want to do the hard work to make these things real. And I just became really frustrated um, because having, for me, I just couldn't understand the concept of spending your life doing something that you hate just to survive. I just didn't understand that or that you couldn't, didn't believe it. Like I just, it, it just didn't make sense to me. And so um, um, I kind of went through a bit of a, an existential, I can't say the word, existential, thank you, I can write it, I cannot say that word for the life of me, crisis at some point when I was trying to figure out who am I, what am I going to do, these are the things that I believe and I think are important and everyone's saying you'll never get a job, you'll never survive and you won't, you know, you need to eat and, you know, and, and so, you know, it's just the idea of pursuing a career because it pays this was just difficult for me. And so um, I followed my heart. And um, so my, in my undergraduate degree, I went to college. Um, before going to college, I took some time and I did an AmeriCorps program because I was really into like, you know, volunteering and community service. So I did that. And um, I just really 
um, you know, did a lot of work like in the community and um, was always, you know, I worked in refugee resettlement and I worked in youth programs and, you know, all of these different things. And um, I, you know, was frustrated by people who would treat my clients like they were less than because they, you know, were not born in America or, you know, working with, you know, when I worked in the housing project, treating, you know, the children there, you know, poorly because of, you know, where they lived or just all of these different things. And then, um, you know, getting involved in, you know, HIV advocacy and, and you know, racial justice and some other things. And every, at every step, it was always like, here's the non-person, here's the person that's not worthy. And I was mad. And I was like, this is BS, you know, like, <laughs> I was upset, uh, very upset and hurt. And I didn't know what to do about it. And I decided I needed to do something. Just being mad wasn't going to change anything. So I would, find ways to kind of jump in and try to, you know, you know, impact things in some small way. And it just kind of started to grow. And, um, and I just kind of used the tools that I had, which in most cases were writing and what I knew to just try to do something. And, you know, and, um, and so it's just really kind of been a series of a lot of things snowballing, you know, um, over time, um, to where one opportunity or, you know, or one, you know, collaboration led to another, or one failure led you to meet this person or one effort um, fed another. And it's just kind of been a journey. So I, I couldn't have really um, envisioned the path, like, you know, growing up, you think you're gonna do this, this and this, and it's been kind of more like this, but it's been, um, you know, the journey that I think I'm meant to take. I can definitely relate to that with mm -hmm. progress or just life in general being very nonlinear. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, I appreciate that you are, are kind of talking about how you've been so values driven. I think that that. And it, it can be hard because I mean, I, I remember there have been times when being values driven meant that I'm applying for public assistance because I'm broke. And I, you know what I mean? Like it's difficult, it's hard, you know, but ultimately, you know, and I don't, and I, I, I never will, you know, criticize anyone for doing what they have to do. Just, I personally just can't do that very well. Like even in high school, I think about when, you know, when everyone was starting to apply for jobs, all the, you know, teenagers when we were old enough going to the mall and filling out every application. That's when you still fill out a lot of applications by hand <laughs> and, and, you know, filling out some online and people would ask, why do you want to work here? And I was terrified of someone ever asking me that question. So I didn't apply to certain places because my answer would have been because I need money. You know what I mean? um, not because because there's no other reason. I don't really like this place, but if you pay people, you have a sign that says hiring on your website, it says hiring. You know what I mean? That's not the answer that people want. So fortunately, if I could find something that I enjoyed doing, I could give a more an answer that was more authentic. I could talk about, you know, the programs that they run and how, you know, I find them interesting and how I feel that I can bring this to it and so on. And so my interest and my enthusiasm often would um, help mitigate my, you know, awkwardness and, you know, would open doors. Cool. <laughs> my next question. So when you were considering parenthood, what resources were available to you? Did these resources feel accessible, inaccessible, something in between? So this is an interesting question um, because um, when I was a teenager, um, I learned that I was um, infertile and I would not have any biological children. And so I had wanted, you know, growing up, I had wanted to have both biological and adoptive children. And so you know, learning that I was, you know, that, that one route was close was, was difficult for me, you know, so as a teen, I mourned and all that. And then I was like, okay, don't have to use birth control, you know, <laughs> that was my mindset. But anyway, um, <laughs> which that's not a very wise mindset, but I was young. But anyway, um, I, um, a lot of the things that I read, so I started researching things about adoption and, um, and I was too young and not in a place to where I would have even been able to adopt, but I was just trying to read ahead and learn. And a lot of the things that I read were very, very disheartening. First of all, there were a lot of parents who seemed like adoption was their second choice. It's not that they wanted to, it's just that they kind of had to. And again, I understand circumstances are different. You know, the how families are, are formed, there's no wrong way to form a family. I um, mean, they look all kinds of ways, but um, you know, it was kind of depressing sometimes to read forums and message boards where people are, you know, seem like they really need to be seeking some help 
to work through their grief as opposed to adding to their family right now. Um, there were a lot of things that people would write about children of color that were really disturbing. Um, you'd look at the price differences, like almost like you're shopping. It was just, it was a lot of it seemed very like almost like um, really capitalist and, and ick. Um, and so, um, you know, and there was a lot of what I see kind of with autism, there were these parents elevating themselves, you know, like, oh, special parent is, you know, special kids get special parents and, oh, you're such a wonderful person for saving this child. You know, like, no, you know, I, I just, there were a lot of things that I read that the minds, they, they were really, really disturbing um, and didn't seem to me um, to be really family centered at all. Um, and then, um, you know, I adopted um, and, you know, some years later, you know, surprise, surprise, I ended up, you know, pregnant with a miracle baby and then later another. So, you know, there were, you know, so even though that wasn't supposed to be the case for me, I ended up conceiving. And um, the information that I read about pregnancy was very inaccessible. Um, nothing matched my reality, even though at the time I was not aware of being autistic. I knew my body and I knew my thoughts and the things that I read, I devoured everything I could come across. And the things that I read, some of them were, in, were you know, helpful, like telling you about how, what size the baby would be or what's forming and so on. But there were a lot of things that didn't have anything to do with my reality um, whatsoever. They didn't describe the feelings, like the senses that I was having. Um, they did not um, prepare me for, you know, like the, the sensory things or for childbirth. There were things, there was one very, very popular book that people recommend to almost anyone who's pregnant. And they, in at least two places in the book, talked about how primitive cultures, where their children sleep in the bed with their babies or wear them on their back. I'm like primitive cultures, like my West African cultures, primitive. Yet people are, you know, now, but then all of a sudden baby wearing and all that stuff became like this cool trendy thing, you know? So, you know, it just was really odd. And so, um, there weren't a lot of things that were really affirming of, you know, of, of families of color um, or of families that are formed in a non-traditional manner because I started out as, you know, as a single mom by choice through adoption and then having my kids. So everything was kind of like this very narrow um, and, um, and had a lot of assumptions about one's income level and, um, you know, social norms about parenting and what, you know, um, you know, that from the very beginning didn't seem right to me. Like, you know, I didn't really think that, you know, you can have a, a crib and a, your baby in another room, but do you have to? I mean, what's wrong with co-sleeping? What's wrong with, you know, so a lot of these things just really didn't meet, match my reality. Um, and so I had to go looking for things that were a lot more obscure, um, like forums that were by moms of color and um, things of that nature to, um, to, to find a place where I felt that I could actually beyond just the, you know, maybe the physiological things about parenting, um, where I could find material that felt practical and real. Um, and then well, since being a, a parent, since my diagnosis, I found, and I know we'll probably talk about this later, that so much of, you know, so this is just parenting in general, but when you start talking about um, neurology, um, there, you know, so nearly every tool assumes, you know, if they're talking about parenting an autistic child, they are assuming that you're coming from the lens of being autistic or non-autistic um, parent. And that's the, you know, that's the, the whole, you know, frame of everything that you're reading. And that's, you know, not necessary. And then not just the things that you read, but also places that you go, support groups or our online groups or, you know, what have you, you know, like peer programs, they're all kind of designed that way. That's the status quo, the norm. So um, something that you mentioned earlier, my, my mind kind of latched onto it and it's okay if you don't feel comfortable answering this, but um, what were the kind of sensory things that weren't being addressed in the pregnancy resources that you were finding? So I know everyone's pregnancy is different, but um, so one thing that happened is initially I didn't, wasn't aware that I was pregnant. And I think that there's a lot of research, you know, I know that, you know, like Aspire and um, Autism 
in, in adulthood journal and you know other you know places that have you know some pretty incredible research have found that there are a lot of inequities um, in, you know in terms of the health of autistic adults versus you know others and um, and so we also find you know when you're accustomed to going to the doctor and saying this is happening and they kind of blow you off or think that you're not making sense um, or if you don't really understand what your body's telling you all the time, you know, sometimes then it, it, you know, so I was not aware that I was pregnant until I was nearly in my second trimester. A, because I wasn't supposed to be able to get pregnant, but B, I don't know what the symptoms are supposed to have. The traditional symptoms that they talked about, all the morning sickness and all that, those were not my symptoms, you know, and so I didn't understand I was very fatigued. Uh, I had to use the restroom a lot, you know, there were things like that, but it was like, I wasn't having what the typical, um, you know, symptoms were. So initially I felt like most of the things I read, um, there were resources where people were barely, you know, and then I also did not have regular menstrual cycles. So that was another thing that, you know, um, you know, was, is something that isn't, you know, that happens in, you know, the autistic community as well. And so the things that I'm reading, well, first, there were people who seemed very, very early on, who seemed to have these different symptoms or physical symptoms where they knew, or, you know, hormonal things where they knew, and that wasn't the case for me. What I had was, um, you know, there were certain, there were two particular foods that had a smell that could make me nauseous. But other than that, I never experienced morning sickness. I did get kind of like a pregnancy induced gout, so swelling. Um, I did have, um, you know, like food cravings for certain things, certain textures and certain tastes of food and things like that. So I had some of those things, but I might, you know, the things that a lot of the things that they talked about occurring in your body, you know, your breasts feeling heavier. I mean, they did, but they didn't, you know, like, so a lot of the things that they, they mentioned, oh, expect this, expect that, expect that. I'm waiting for these things to happen to me and they're not happening. And so um, once I did know I was pregnant and so, um, you know, and then there were other things they didn't explain, you know, clearly like, you know, lactation, you know, they never, the, the amount of discomfort <laughs> that um, I felt when the, you know, that there was not nothing that adequately described it. And again, it could have been heightened because of my senses, but the amount of discomfort that I felt when, um, when I was lactating or the way your nipples, no one talks about what your nipples feel like or look like or how they swell in size or how they, they might start turning colors. They turned darker and the areolas. And then when I was breastfeeding, they, they skin flaked off them and they were like pinkish. And I was like, I'm dark skin. I was like, huh? Like, like this, I'm not in pink, you know, like <laughs> just this, you know, so there were a lot of things. Oh, no one talked about what it feels like when you're engorged, you know, just some of these things that like they had descriptions, but the descriptions didn't work. Like even in the hospital, lots of pressure, lots of pressure. I'm like, no, that's not pressure. That is pain. Say pain, you know what I mean? Like, so things like that. Thank you for clarifying that. Sure. So my next question, so this is kind of a lot of context, mm -hmm. but um, there are numerous situations where someone receiving an autism diagnosis can mean that they lose custody of their children. Mm -hmm. In general, there are many historical examples and also present day examples of disabled and neurodivergent people not having their reproductive rights respected, whether that's, again, losing custody of children, um, forced sterilization, and a variety of other um, things. In your opinion, what are some ways to fight against these practices? I think there's a lot of things that need to be done. Um, so first and foremost, I think a lot of this goes back to the infantilization that people have of, of people with disabilities that, you know, they can't possibly um, have sexual interest or have interest in relationships or parenting that were basically children in adult bodies. And so there is, you know, in terms of getting, um, you know, comprehensive and effective um, sex ed that's, you know, that addresses our situation. Um, I think that that doesn't happen um, appropriately. I think that um, people are kind of, are gaslit and, you um, you know, and micromanaged, you know, even, you know, you know, even into adulthood in terms of, um, you know, people obtaining guardianship when there are other means, you know, of shared decision making that can be considered and or not or, or living circumstances that are restrictive, maybe beautiful, 
but still ultimately you're not a big institution, but this little cutesy group home or condo or farm or whatever you have, can they have visitors of, you know, can they have visitors come over, overnight visitors, can they engage in activities that a non-disabled person might want to engage in um, or, or are, are their days regimented? Um, in terms of the custody aspect, there's a, um, the National Council on Disabilities, um, their, um, their guide, um, the, you know, rocking the cradle, it talks up a lot about the, um, some of the issues with regard to disability and parenting. And there's, um, you know, 10 states and, you know, well, and in, in, in including a two territories where in the absence of neglect or abuse, um, the non-disabled parent gets prefer, you know, typically gets preferential treatment over a disabled parent in a custody dispute. And so when you look at the disproportionality of um, the child welfare system, um, they, you know, disability and um, being a person of color or other marginalizations kind of are really just kind of right in there. And so I feel like um, we need to first um, that people need to value, we need to really address the ableism in society. It shouldn't be acceptable to um, sterilize someone against their will or not allow them to, to, you know, to date or have, you know, or raise a family or whatever it is because of a disability. So first, I think from before anyone gets even grows up from just the, the principle of our society at large, we need to revamp and look at things such as, you know, the, the human rights of, of individuals and um, consider that reproductive rights are human rights. So um, we need to kind of really, really revamp the way that we see human people in general, including disability. Um, and we need, um, I would really love to see this addressed more in, um, you know, in, in reproductive justice circles. It is addressed some, but not enough. And I think that um, this is an area where, um, you know, having allies in that community would be uh, of key importance because this just goes back to, again, our, you know, bodily autonomy and, and health and, um, you know, all of these things, equity that aren't the case. Um, and people's concerns and fear about the, the autism diagnosis and losing custody is a real fear. It's something that nearly happened to my family. Um, and that still scars us, you know, and, and you know, and, and there's still a lot of trauma related uh, about that today. And then, not even just custody, um, um, losing custody. You can have situations where you may not even be able to come become a parent because everyone is not does not plan to have children um, through you know biological means. There are foster and adoptive agencies that will deny you if you um, are neurodivergent, um, in particular autistic. It's happened to me. Um, you know, I still have the official letter where that was the reason why we were denied. We met every other criteria, the income and you know, health and references and everything like that. But that was, um, they had a policy that they did not want um, people with certain conditions to, they didn't feel that they were capable of parenting. Um, so I think that it's gonna take the voices of a lot of people, not just those of us who, for whom this impacts, but people in general. Because I don't think, first of all, the, the average person does not know, you know, how per pervasive this is, they don't. I know I didn't know. So first, people need to become more aware and then they need to use their, their platform, their influence to change these things um, because it just continues just the cycle that we already see of, of loss and, and, you know, and destruction and violence against um, you know, marginalized people. Absolutely. Yes, that is very important for everybody to know. So the next question, um, what are some things that you wish holistic parents, and again, this means non-autistic parents understood about raising autistic children? Ooh, <laughs> a lot. So first, I wish that people wouldn't start with the default that being holistic is the way, the standard, the norm by which everything should be measured. And so, um, because like, you, you know, so that automatically um, colors the way people talk about their children, um, people treat them. And, and, and I'm taking, I'm shifting away from people who are narcissistic, abusive or whatever, you know, I'm taking that out. I'm just talking about your run of the mill everyday parent cares about your kid, not perfect. You make your flaws, you know, but ultimately you are, you know, you care about their well-being. but the lack of understanding of your child's neurology to position your child, the, the, the neurology that your child has as this enemy um, is to position your child 
as an enemy, whether you see it or not. You can't separate the child and the condition. You can't love, hate this thing about your child that you love your child. That doesn't make sense because that thing is something that is deeply interwoven into your child. So that's one thing I wish people would um, would um, think. You know, I know it's an old, it's old, but Jim Sinclair's "Don't Mourn for Us." I think it's a very, very important thing for parents to read. Um, a lot of, um, in the disability community, a lot of times when you get a, your, a child that's diagnosed um, as autistic, you get the welcome to Holland and you get the 100 day kit. And I don't think those are the, the, the you know, tools that are representative of most people's lives um, or the best kind of the initial things that you should be reading. Um, I wish people understood that um, autistic adults have been autistic children whether or not they uh, received their diagnosis in childhood or later in life, they have been an autistic child. And so they have some understanding of the child's circumstances and needs and you know, thoughts and abilities that um, others don't have. And I know parents are big to say, I'm my child's voice. I know my child better than anybody. Yes and no. Yes, you absolutely know your child more than strangers who may not know anything about your child. You know what they like to do, you know their favorite color, you know how to comfort them. That's your baby. You are an integral part of their world, um, but you aren't their voice and neither are autistic adults. Your child is, has their own voice. You can amplify their voice. Um, you can be you know, a, a proxy if needed for their voice, but you're not their voice and neither are we. But you know things about your individual child, but you don't know the inner workings of your child. You don't know, you, there's certain things that you don't know because you can't know because you've never walked that walk. And so it, is, it can only benefit you and your child to listen and consider the perspective of people who've been there um, and everything's not going to necessarily apply, but some things are. And just because you're annoyed by it or it's unfamiliar or you don't like the delivery doesn't mean there isn't truth in what's being told you know, what's being shared. And so I think that that's an important thing that people need to do. So regardless of the fact that you might not be enamored with the messaging, um, consider the message. Um, I also wish that they under, that all uh, the parents understood that they're a lot more capable than they think they are. I think well-intentioned, well-meaning professionals gaslight holistic parents a great deal um, because and and some of them aren't well-intentioned because autism is big business it's a huge industry there's a lot of money to be made from desperate worried uninformed people and so I think that um, if, if you have a person if you convince a person that you know better than they do you have x amount of years working with these types of children you have x amount of letters behind their name the parent may or may not feel like they have a lot of knowledge about life but they don't have knowledge about this they're entrusting you and you're making broad generalizations um, about their child and, and the lifespan when you can't really know because our development is not, um, you know, doesn't go on the same trajectory as other people. So you can't foresee what your child will or will not be able to do. And what they are not able to do doesn't make them, you know, inhuman or unworthy. Their inherent worth is just in being who they are. And so I wish that people would understand that um, we need love just like any other child. We need to be cared for and to be nurtured and to be taught like any other person. And going against your instincts as a parent to follow what someone tells you to impose upon your, your child because it's the way um, is going to create a rift and it's going to harm you and your child in some way that you may not see now, but you will, the, but the it will you know bear fruit at some point, bitter fruit, um, strange fruit. Yes, going back to your point about autistic adults and how oftentimes their experience as autistic children kind of isn't respected or like taken into, a, into account, I, I feel like something that I observe is that when like oftentimes when self-advocacy groups that are run by autistic people like say something about their experience or something about uh, um, the experiences of autistic children more broadly. People if my child is like you, I consider my child cured, or you're not like my child, right. or you yeah. don't know what it's like to blah, blah, blah. They shut the person down as soon as they share anything. You're high functioning. How do you know? I know real autism, severe autism, et cetera, et cetera. 
<laughs> and yeah, but- it's horrible because first of all, we're not, there's no mild and severe. We're not sauce. You know what I mean? We're people. But, um, and then high, low functioning. I don't like that anymore than I like high yellow, pretty eyes, good, you know, good hair. Those are inaccurate, imprecise descriptions. Say what it is that you mean. Are you trying to say this person's non-speaking? Are you trying to say that they, they have an intellectual disability? Are you trying to say that they have high support needs? Say what it is that you're actually trying to say so that you can make sense so people can understand what's happening. Because one thing doesn't equal one thing. Just because you say this, you see this trait, this trait, and this trait, that doesn't mean a person's functioning level is what you perceive. But even if it so-called is, and again, it isn't. Um, I feel like pe- no one knows what a person's uh, private life is like. No one knows what a person's childhood was like. I mean, it, it's hilarious to me when people make all these remarks and I'm thinking, you know, I have a house full of, of disabled children. Every last one of my children, biological and not, has um, some form of disability. And there are, you know, some of these concerns that people say that are real autism are any human being in distress can have issues with incontinence, can have issues with self-injurious behavior, can have issues with communication, which can have issues with comprehension or any of these things. What's going on? What unmet need is not being addressed or what? You know, what is their, you know, behavior communicating? Um, and, and that could be in the presence of or absence of autism. I think people look at these things and they make an assumption. So if your child's not speaking out of their mouth, they can't communicate, that's ridiculous. You know, and I think we've all learned that since the, the pandemic that you don't need a mouth to communicate or to connect. You know what I mean? We, you know, there's multiple ways because you aren't familiar with the way or because someone plays a certain way or engages a certain way or has a certain facial expression or tone that you, you know, when you're looking at it through the holistic lens, you're not understanding what that means. Um, you know, you're, you're, a, you're pathologizing something that you simply don't understand. And, and I think at their core, people, they may not understand, like, I think a parent knows my son loves to, you know, spin this around or my, my kid loves to, to watch this. They don't know why, but they know their kid likes it. And I think most of them find some joy in it. Even though I think it's kind of weird, they find some joy in it, but they're told, no, make your child play appropriately, communicate this way, do this and do that. And so again, gaslighting oneself, going against one's own, um, you know, parental instinct um, and doing probably what feels very alien in the beginning um, to one's child for the greater good. And it's just a shame, you know, it doesn't have to occur. It teaches your child that you need to perform and to be someone else and to be something else, to be worthy of love and respect. Right, and and when, you know, autistic adults are able to, you know, get to the level of like being able to like use their gifts in the best way for them, and then they're given that criticism of like, oh, you're not like my child. It's it's just like, well, you're not seeing all the work that went into that. Like, exactly. Or you're not seeing the way the person is at home. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not, I speak, but I have my days every single week that I'm non-speaking. I thank God for AAC, you know, because there's no way I could not go seven day, 24 hours, say seven days a week and just doing all of these things. That's just not, words don't always come for me or, or certain areas. I have a lot of executive function issues. I have a lot of areas where I need support and resources and help. And then when there are people who do maybe present like their child, then people will just say that they're not real. Oh, that person's not really, it's their facilitator that's really typing that, or they're not really, they're, you know, I mean, so make up your mind. Either this person is not enough like your child, this person presents like your child, but they, that has to be all fake. What they've typed, what they've experienced, what they're thinking can't be real, you know? And I just find that ridiculous. You can't have it both ways. Exactly. So next, um, what is your overall philosophy of parenthood? So I like scripting. And so there's so many different, um, like, you know, phrases and stuff like that, that could apply to parenting. And but one, I think about some commercial or I don't know, from when I was a kid, I don't even think it was about parenting, it's probably about the military or something, but it was like, the toughest job you'll ever love, you know, but, and that's what I see. I think parenting, I, um, it's interesting because of the fact that I, I feel that, you know, families can look all types of ways. And I think there are legitimate families there, you know, there are a number of people in our community who are child free and, um, and they can love on their friends, kids or their nieces and nephews or nibblings or whatever. And that's all cool. But I think for me, for me, parenting um, is just, is something that's, it, it is really transformed. I can't think of anything in my life that has transformed the way that I think and the way that I feel 
in the way that parenting has, to have someone that you are responsible for, that you care for, that you have to usher through this world, that you want to help shape into a person that, that's going to be, you know, be happy and whole. It's just such a major responsibility and it's so scary and it's so hard and it's so rewarding at the same time. My children, I've learned so much from them. I've gained and grown as a person so much from being a parent. And so I just, I'm, I'm grateful. And I think that parents need to understand that the, your job as a parent is to love and be there for your child. And your child's job is not to, um, you, you're not gonna live vicariously through your child or they're not going to um, have to, you know, jump through certain hoops or be a certain way to be uh, um, your child um, if you need that. And there's actually something I wrote once a few years ago. I'm gonna try to find it. Um, it's about, it's a post about something else, but I was ref it, it was some thoughts that I had about a, an old friend of mine and some, um, a rift between her and her parents. And um, I just wrote a few notes about parenting. Um, in this case, this was a friend who was neurodivergent and trans and the family had a lot of difficulty with um, accepting their daughter and which caused a lot of problems for her. And even as a, as a teenager, I knew that this was, was wrong and it, it was hurtful. And so I wrote some things, I ran into her once and it caused me to write some things down about my thoughts about parenting. And so I'm going to um, um, read it a little bit. Um, so I wrote, um, the big gaping tremendous difference between Kai and I was our relationships with our parents. So I was talking about it wasn't about her ethnicity or being trans. When I had a difficult day at school or was bullied or clashed with a teacher or was treated unfairly or had sensory overload or whatever list of endless things that I encountered, I could count on my family lifting me up. They always had my back. My older brother would threaten to beat up whomever was bothering me my dad would start drafting one of his infamous letters to the school administrators. My mother would plan to take off yet another day of work to accompany me to school, to write whatever wrong had occurred. And as ableism, racism, and misogyny was then, and still is pretty rampant in schools, there were plenty of those isms and more to deal with. My younger brother would tell me some silly story about his day to cheer me up and make me laugh. My home wasn't perfect and my family definitely wasn't, but they made my home a haven. I didn't have to hide my stimming, although my mother did let me know that some of my louder vocal stems were irritating sometimes. It wasn't a big deal that I liked to play the same songs over and over or liked to eat the same food prepared a certain way, especially when I was upset. Whether I had a good day or a bad day, I knew usually that when I got home, at least most of the bad was over, that I could relax. And then, so I gave some examples of my friend, and, but here's the part where I started talking about parents. Um, hold on. Um, kids grow up. So much of connected parenting focuses on when our kids are young, making them feel secure and loved and comfortable with who they are. But of what benefit is it to your child if you fight with the world to accept your child's differences at two or five or 10 when you, the parent, won't accept your child's differences at 13 or 16 or 20? Parenting is a lifelong job a lifelong commitment. Kids grow up, but your responsibility to them doesn't disappear if they can walk, talk, dress themselves, or drive. You're still supposed to be there, even when you don't fully understand, even when you don't fully agree, whatever. You don't withdraw your love. You don't withdraw your support. Your child may or may not crave your approval, but they would probably appreciate your acceptance. I mean, that's the currency of being a parent, isn't it? That you are going to love and accept them. They don't owe you anything. They don't owe you choices you deem acceptable. They don't owe you a particular gender identity, nor a particular religious belief, nor a particular sexual orientation, nor a particular political affiliation. Kai was lied to. Most of us have been lied to, have been made to believe that we aren't deserving of a parent's love unless we perform, unless we conform. That is crap. It's the biggest lie and sadly a widespread one. Children don't owe us anything, but we, the parents, owe them. We owe them, we owe them big time. We owe them a sense of safety, we owe them our love, we owe them our understanding, or at least a concerted effort to understand, even if we don't always fully understand. 
We owe them the assurance that we will provide them with the resources they need. And we owe them our support throughout the lifetime. We owe them all of that and so much more, period. If you cannot profess to love a child who turns out to be neurodivergent, who turns out to be transgender, who turns out to be non-binary, who turns out to be disabled, who turns out to be a different faith tradition than you raised them to be, who turns out to be anything other than heterosexual, who turns out to be themselves, then you are not a parent. You are not their family. And you have forfeited your right to cast judgment on the individuals that your child selects to be their family of choosing, the family you could have been but refused to be for them. I really love that. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. <laughs> All right. This is, I believe, my last question. And uh, what have been the most rewarding aspects of being an autistic parent to autistic children or just? parent to children in general. <laughs> yeah, so all my children, there are things rewarding about all of them, um, in, you know, in their own different ways. Um, so with the autistic children, um, and even the other ones, so it's interesting, if you have an autistic mom, I think some of that, you know, kind of rubs off on you, whether you're autistic or not, some of the mannerisms, you know, and um, it, it's interesting. Um, and but um, one thing that I really love is that I can be real with them, yeah, I'm real with all my kids, but with my autistic kids, like I can be like, ugh, don't hug me, mommy needs a break. And they're not offended. They don't like burst into tears. I, it's not about you, I love you, I just can't be touched right now. <laughs> they understand, because sometimes they don't wanna be touched. You know, I've kissed them and they wiped those kisses off, you know, before <laughs> I've hugged them and they've kind of been like, okay. You know, so they get it. Um, we don't always have to talk. We can just be in the same, you know, in each other's vicinity and that's love. You know, they'll put their, their foot on me or their elbow or whatever, like a body part. And I just feel the love, you know, in that communication. We love to script together. We script all through, around the house together, different stuff. And it's just really awesome. And, um, you know, and I thank God, you know, it's just, you know, we can, I can explain things to them and they can, you know, in, in the way that my brain already works and typically they understand. And then I think one thing that's helpful is because I've been through certain things or experienced certain things, although they are individuals, they're not a clone of me, it gives me some insight into the things that they are, um, you know, that they, they might need or they might go through. And it's just a blessing. Um, in terms of my other children, like, I feel like they, um, they're neurodivergent as well, although not autistic, but they keep me on my toes because like I have to learn, okay, these are the kind of dumb things that I'm gonna have to say in, in this setting or whatever. <laughs> like, sorry, I shouldn't say dumb, but these are the kind of illogical things that I'm gonna have to say. Like, you know, like for example, my daughter will be saying something and then I'll say, Mom, are you listening to me? I'm like, yes, you said this, 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 and this. Oh, but you didn't respond. I'm like, oh, that's right. People like you to nod and smile and um, repeat something they said. Like, and all those things show like these like tactile, physical signs that you're interested or listening or whatever, or they want you to look at them or, whatever, you know, or, you know, so little things like that. So they, they kind of train me like, oh yeah, that's what you have to do. People want that stuff, you know, or I need that stuff. And, um, and they're funny, you know, like they, they keep me uh, in, you know, up to date on things or they'll let me know something, mom, don't say that. Somebody will think that's rude or don't do that. You know, so like they're, and, and they're just awesome people. Like all, all my kiddos, I just love them. Um, but I'm grateful that they accept me for me. Um, and I make mistakes and, and I'm not perfect. And there's things that I do that get on their nerves, just like they get on mine, but I'm just grateful. I, I feel like being autistic, I don't know what other, it's made me the mom that I am. And I don't think I could, I would be the mom that I am if I it was different. I think that it has, it has caused me to make sure, you know, I, I, to think deeply about things and to be um, forthright and honest and vulnerable. My, my children don't have to worry about me admitting that I'm wrong. I'll admit that I'm wrong quick or saying sorry. They, they're, you know, there's no such thing as I'm the adult, I can't be wrong. And I know more than you just because I happen to be the parent. That's not the way it works. You know, they have their voices and perspectives and feelings matter. Um, and I think that it, it makes for a different type of relationship when you, you know, have, when you already have to, you know, you're, you've already been kind of beaten and bruised by the world. Um, it, it makes you, I don't know, so much, so, you know, cognizant of taking care of your own, you know. 
and we love to sing legacy you want to come sing with me but don't get on camera okay you see and she said no so like the other day i did a um a keynote and i sang um dragon soul because i love we love that's another thing we love watching dragon ball dragon ball z dragon ball super together our kids and i steven universe so we like to perseverate on stuff together we like make up rhyming words around the house or whatever um so so the other day they were asleep she and her brother and they couldn't um sing along with me and so that's why i was like oh i could sing she could sing with me but she's like eh, no don't want to so <laughs> my kids have no problem telling me no if i say please go get mommy a drink I, you know and they're like okay i'll get it i don't want to get it but i'll get it I'm like, okay great I'm like i didn't feel like getting the remote or whatever for my parents either but i still got it. <laughs> so like you know things that i think other people would consider rude we don't have to filter we you know we're real and it's, and the love is real just as much as, you know, when we don't, you know, we're not judging, you know, I, I can't remember the last time we eye contact and you could be looking at the wall, you know, you're here, I'm talking to you, we're listening, we don't have to be looking at each other for that to be the case. <laughs> That's really cool. Thank you so much for sharing sure. all of that. Mm -hmm. So that was, again, my last question. Mm -hmm. And once again, I want to thank you so much for being here and for being so open and just like giving so much information, so much uh, vulnerability. I, I really, I'm just really, I'm going to be thinking about a lot of what you said. Um, so thank you to everybody who was able to attend today. Sure. You did, I was wondering, so were, did, were we, did we have till the hour uh, um, or are we supposed to end now? I couldn't remember our closing time. Um, did you have more to say or? But it, it's not mandatory. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, can, we have to the hour if you want. Um, yeah, go for it. Um, what I was thinking is, um, if, if it's okay, there was something that I wanted to read because um, it's, um, it's, I you know, kind of like when I said parenting is the toughest job you'll ever love. It's, um, beautiful and it's rewarding, but it is definitely hard. And so, um, and not necessarily because of the children themselves. And so there's something that I wrote when I actually wrote this in 2017. Um, and, um, and it's just talking about like a, a lot of people talk about things like imposter syndrome or they're feeling like, you know, so you hear people of color or queer people or younger people or whatever, you know, all these things where, okay, do I really have what it takes to be in this setting? You know, like a lot of us, we do belong, but you're, you're one that second guessing of oneself, you know, and um, because so much of the material that's out there about autistic children is, you know, raising autistic children is by, you know, holistic parents, you come to wonder, I, I know when I, you know, I, there was a point, you know, a, a one week moment where I, you know, considered giving my children up when they were little, I was like, they're still really, really little and really cute. White people will adopt them and they'll love them because um, <laughs> I can't do this. I clearly don't have what it, you know, like your the messaging that you get. Um, and that's why a lot, you know, like I was, yeah, I guess I should say privileged in that I wasn't aware of my neurology once I, you know, to have that as another thing to be worried about when I was pregnant because the world will teach you that you are incompetent. You can't th understand anything. You can't do this, you can't do that. How could you possibly raise a child? And how could you possibly raise a child in an ableist world? And so um, I, you know, I love my kids. I, I would die for them um, and I do the best that I can. And I feel that I am a good mom, but I have my struggles too. And so one day I wrote this um, and I read it at a conference once and I, you know, I've never really done much with it, but I was, I was um, parenting about, I mean, uh, presenting about parenting and it, it got me really emotional when I read it. So hopefully it won't now, but I mean, if it does, it does. But, um, and if people have to disconnect, that's fine, but it's called, Am I Mom Enough? And the reason I wanted to read it is because I think that the, you know, maybe it captures some of the thoughts or feelings that other people have about um, themselves or, you know, about, you know, being autistic parents or about the possibility of being a parent or just the responsibility. And so I just kind of want to share these are, you know, like, you know, stream of consciousness type of thing. And so the title of it is called, Am I Mom Enough? Voices in My Head. Um, Even though I know better, sometime, I'm wondering, would it be better to put this on the screen? I could give you the URL or should I just read it off my phone? Just thinking about people's, you know, if people are visual. Um, if it, I can, give you the ability to screen share. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Yay. Okay, so. Make you the host and or make you co-host. 
All right, cool. So this is on the respectfully connected site. And do, 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 do. Um, all righty. And back here. And share screen. Am I long enough? Share. Okay, so this is something, um, a collaborative writing project that I'm part of, um, Respectfully Connected. So it's respectfullyconnected.com is where this is. And it's the post, and my mom enough voices in my head. Um, and so um, there's an image with a line sheet of paper that says, am I enough on it? And so I'll just go through and read um, this post and you know, hopefully it might resonate with some people I'm gonna move us over here. Okay. Even though I know better, sometimes it's hard not to feel like a failure. Kids get older, things change, people change and circumstances change. It's never easy, this type of parenting, but it gets so complicated as the children grow. It's so different, a big change. I'm autistic, I don't like change. I'm scared of change. I can't control things when they change. So much of friendship and socializing at this age depends on the parent to arrange, facilitate, develop the connections, to model it as well. It's especially important when you know that your child can't or won't do it for themselves. But what complicates the matter is that I can't do it either. I'm not made that way. I'm not like other moms. I can't be the room mom. I can't chat it up every day at pick up and drop off with other parents. I can't handle the loud, crowded birthday parties. I'm not savvy enough to score play dates with classmates for my friends. I haven't heard that song or read that magazine article. I haven't watched that show or that sports game. I don't have cooking or decorating tips to share. I am anxious about lock-ins, sleepovers, and other activities where I can't assure my kids' safety. I don't like being out in the elements. I don't like not having a plan. I want you all to have friends. You need friends, right? It's a part of life, development, coming of age. I know you're content alone or with family, but maybe you need more too and just don't know it because I'm not doing a good job at giving it to you. I'm cultivating you to think that it's okay to be like me. Maybe you don't want to be like me. Maybe you want to be kind of like them too. How do I get you friends? How do I play the game right? So these moms won't think I'm a freak and they will consider letting you in. And then if we pass that barrier, we still don't even know if you will make friends with their child. Maybe you won't have anything in common. Maybe it's too much hassle. Maybe they'll think you're weird. And then I will shut the whole thing down because I'm not going to let anyone shun or hurt my baby. Maybe you just won't be in the mood to exert the spoons to try something new, like meeting a classmate in an unfamiliar environment on that particular day, which I understand. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm too much of everything, too much for everyone, maybe even myself. I overthink everything. Overdo everything, overstress over everything, and end up not accomplishing anything. The mom stuff, stuff, the small talk. I can do it in small doses, but I can't sustain it over time. Not being me. I have to be me. I want to be me. But I will be something else if I have to, if it will benefit you. Just to gain you access, get you through the door. Once you are inside, prayerfully how wonderful you are will be apparent. I just need to get them to see you, really see you. I will be whatever I need to be for you, but I only want you to be you. Don't change for anyone. You are perfect. Do as I say, not as I do. Don't be like me. Here we are. I am devastated. I try and fail. And then because I have previously failed, I am plagued with trepidation and doubt, which makes it even harder to try again. 
which makes me suck at it even more. You don't have any friends. I don't think you do. You don't seem to miss not having any. You don't seem to care. Is that normal? Am I making you friendless, abnormal? You smile every day. Is it real? Are you really happy? Is this enough for you? Am I giving you enough, showing you enough? Am I trying hard enough, doing enough for you? My child, my children, my loves, you are the reason I draw breath. Am I failing you? How can I help you do something I don't even know how to do? How can I teach you something I have never been good at? How can I get them, other kids, to accept you, want to know you, to like you, when I can't navigate the parent layer that guards that gate? All people don't socialize the same way. Deep down inside me, I know there's nothing wrong with who I am, with how I am. That even if I wasn't an autistic mom, I shouldn't have to feel forced to conform to contrived social gender norms of how a mom is supposed to be with regard to supporting her children in friendships and having friendships. I know this cognitively, but that doesn't make me immune to the messages that whisper that I'm nothing like what I am supposed to be as a mother, that I'm doing it all wrong, that I am making them social misfits, that my failure to be able to do these things that come so easily to other moms is going to, and already is, having a negative impact on them, that they are going to suffer in life because of this, because of me, and that I am therefore an inadequate mother. I believe in acceptance. I write about acceptance. I present about acceptance. I teach about acceptance. But if I'm going to be real with myself and with you, the truth is living that acceptance in all areas of your life, in all ways, at all times, it's hard. I don't always succeed. I don't have answers to any of my questions. I still don't know if I'm doing this right or wrong. I want to so much for you to be happy. I don't want you to ever go through what I went through. I don't want you to ever feel broken. I don't want you to ever be broken. I don't want you to ever know what it's like to live with these voices in your head that tell you you're not enough, never enough. I evicted them from my head, but they came back when I had you. I'm okay being just me if it was only me, but I don't know if just me as I am is good enough for you, is right for you, is enough for you. I just want to be the mom you need without losing me. Somehow I will find my way. Oh, I got through it and I didn't cry. Like I did the conference, <laughs> sorry. Oh Jesus. But yeah, so some days are harder, you know, like I, I'm, I believe in, you know, our right to be parents. I believe we make amazing freaking parents, um, you know, and, and, and have a lot of strengths and, and you know, and gifts. Um, but it's hard some days, you know, the things that weigh you down in general, you know, they weigh you down also, you know, from the aspect of being a parent. But I think ultimately, you know, one has to, you know, be nurturing, be accepting of oneself, even when you have those difficult days and, and, and live in the truth, you know, of who you are. And that is that you are the best parent that you're going and you're going to continue to be the best parent that you can to your children because they matter their needs matter and you're not going to stop growing and learning thank you so much that was so amazing <laughs> yeah I, I really appreciate that you shared that and um, right i guess you were probably planning to do but the, no i wasn't yes. oh no okay <laughs> Truly really impromptu, but thank you so much. I really, I'm, I'm definitely gonna look more at that website. And that was called um, respectfullyconnected.com. Okay. So it's a, um, it's kind of um, on, on hiatus right now, but it's a project of um, neurodivergent parenting. So different, uh, you know, sharing different ways to 
um, raise children who most of us have autistic children, but there's also, you know, other other you know, neurotypes and to raise them to be proud of who they are and yet still have, you know, a gentle approach. Um, a respectful, a child-centered, a family-centered approach. So um, there's some some good things on there. Um, you know, I encourage people to read. And so some of the um, contributors actually, I'm just trying to see, do I have my book here? I have the, the Sincerely Your Autistic Child book um, is another resource that um, people might want to be interested in looking at. It's our more recent um, a book that was co-edited by myself. Um, and um, a Emily Page Ballou and Sharon Davenport of um, Autistic Women's Network, or Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, I'm sorry. And it's kind of, it's a book of, has 29 chapters and then a forward and a conclusion, um, sharing people's perspectives about, you know, what they want parents to know, what they wish their parents could have known and ways to raise happy, healthy children, kind of like tips. You know, we say it's kind of like part guide, part memoir, part love letter. Um, to parents, you know, to kind of understand where we're coming from so that they can, um, you know, raise little young people who love themselves and accept themselves. That's great. Thank you so much. So um, I guess that concludes our program for the night. Um, thank you to those of you who are able to, to stop by with us. Um, and I hope you have a safe weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here.